All right, sorry for the delay. Uh, should be available, and so the homework was technically due yesterday, Tuesday, right? So the homework will be available. The solutions like five days from that. That way, it's, it's that twenty percent per day thing, and they should really be released automatically on Canvas. Uh, there is another ICA available if you're interested in that. Uh, it'll be due before D1, which is uh, Thursday, so a week from today. Their um, homework C2 doesn't get actually formally assigned until next week. But it is available. Some people have already turned it in. So uh, if you're interested, it's out there. Uh, it's uh, two questions related to random number generation. They come right out of the chapter. The first question is just sort of plug and chug into a formula. Once you find the right formula, you plug it in, you generate five numbers, and you're done. The second question, I give you numbers that uh, could have been come from a random number generator. And you use a Kolmogorov Smirnoff test to test to see if they likely came from a random number generator. And we'll go over the KS test later, but the uh, if you're, but I put a video online that describes how to go through the test, so I actually work an example with different numbers. And so if you're interested in that, uh, I think all the info you need is in the book and, uh, and online if you want to get started on that, that C2. Uh, otherwise, just as another reminder, the arena competition is an alternative you can do for your final project. Uh, the, I keep reminding you because I think the submission deadline is like September 30th. If you want to register for that, for your uh, register a group for that. There's additional competitions. The Flex Sim Simulation or competition also I think has like a September 30th deadline. One sec. And then the Simio one, I don't remember what their deadline is, but I think they actually released the prompt on September 24th. So I think they kind of expect you to be registered before that. Question? Um, do you have to be in the same? Um, again, uh, unless you unless you contact me ahead of time and we kind of figure out uh, a good reason for it, I I'd like to. It's easier for me if you're in the same lab. If you're not in the same lab, I have to do a lot of math to make sure because like the worst thing is, is like if let's say everybody wants to go to the 8 a.m. lab and it's the popular, there just happen to be a lot of people in there. If uh, if we get a lot of imports, we might end up introducing so many groups that we won't be able to cover all the presentations. So I need to kind of make sure that whatever lab you're joining, if that A, you're able, able to present in that lab, and then B, that there's enough space in that lab. So uh, talk to me offline about that, or send me an email, and I can kind of try to do the math and figure that out. Other questions? Yeah, sorry. Um, on the lab, uh, the second part for the critical path, can we use yes. the Excel function I'm okay if you want to use RAND between, that's fine. You don't have to use the inverse transform of uh, RAND you want. It was simpler for me to just throw out, like, here's RAND and here's like a generic function, and that actually relates a lot to what we're going to be doing later in the class. But RAND between, um, as long as, and I don't remember off the top of my head, as long as RAND between gives you a real number and not an integer, then that's fine. As long as you generate an integer between, or a real number between 0 and 1, however you do it, I'm okay. And we'll talk a little bit about Lab 3 uh, today, and then, uh, but uh, have a few questions. Um, so for the second part, on the second part of the lab, for the total, average of the total duration, yes. is that just the average of the critical path, or are we talking about all three? Yeah, so the, the question was, the at, on the second part of the lab, I asked you for the average of the total duration. The total duration is the critical path, so I'm basically looking for the average critical path. So I'm looking for one number, at the very top are also reported in your Word doc that, um, that is just a, what is the average of the max times, where each row has a max time and you're averaging across those. And then just on to ask a bonus question, histogram of the critical path times. Yeah, and then, then the bonus is just a histogram of the critical paths. So the critical paths are effectively the total duration of the activity. So everybody's required to get the average. And as a hint, the average should be greater than 9. 
And then, uh, then the bonus is to actually generate a histogram of those critical paths to see what that's shaped like. And we'll talk about uh, a little bit later today why it's why the average might be greater than nine, even though all of the individual paths average are nine, and uh, and why the shape might be a little funny. Yeah. And follow up on histograms. Do you have like preference or care about what our bins are? For now, no. I, I just uh, that's like kind of as a bonus is that uh, I'm going to force you to do a histogram in the uh, homework after this homework when you actually start generating these random variants. But. Um, Um, so, the, I'm going to force you to generate a histogram, of course, for an 888 number. So it's, you know, so it's complicated. I, I have a Google Voice number, which rings lots of places. And so, uh, hanging up, when I have this set up, usually means hanging up three times. So, uh, until it actually goes away. Technology. Um, I'm sorry. What was the question again? Can you answer my question? I did. Great. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, yeah, histogram. Right. I'm going to force you to do a histogram later, but for now, as long as it's got the right shape. Yeah. Of course. I mean, make. Uh, don't do two bins. You know. I mean, I wanted to actually capture the shape of it, but we'll talk about later, like you know, how to actually choose a good number of bins. But so for now, um, just make sure it. You know, it's. You know, shoot for maybe 10 bins. Like, that's probably a safe bet for this particular distribution. Any other questions? All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so last time uh, we, we've been talking about, you know, spreadsheets, how you might call them cell oriented data flow programming, or de their uh, declarative programming language means we, we only capture relationships between cells, not actually how things are done. And that makes the, initially makes them seem like they'd be challenging to implement a discrete event system simulation in because DES is all about how the state changes. But we can end up representing state. We just have to be kind of clever about how we, we, we put all of these representations together. And so our model for that was this simple MM1Q. Uh, so it's a single channel Q. And so we did this example, and this was kind of the bonus on the homework that was due, uh, I guess, back on Tuesday, uh, is that, you know, it give you inter-arrival times, I give you service times, and as long as you can capture the relevant relationships uh, between elements within a time and across time, then the spreadsheet can end up populating the whole discrete simulation for you. So some of these uh, are pretty maybe obvious how they work. You know, you start with whatever time, the arrival time, you keep adding the inter-arrival time, and the cumulative inter-arrival time is the kind of time, um, of, is the actual arrival time. But other things are a little more complicated. And we went over those formulas last time, like how to calculate the time the service begins and ends and so on. And this isn't how we'll do uh, DES for the rest of the semester, but I wanted you to see that you could do it this way. And you know you can end up getting the same answers that you would if you did it the kind of you know, instant by instant, which is kind of up here. And so we just kind of did a quick demo that you know if I want to know when customer three departs, well the spreadsheet says it departs at 13, and so did the hand simulation. So the spreadsheet can actually end up doing the same calculations that you did here, even though it does them in a very different way. And so that is, uh, were there any questions on how that worked? Or does anybody, is there anything confusing about, hopefully this was relatively straightforward. So today I want to grow that a little bit um, and to say, to show that you can actually make things a little more complicated. You can solve some inventory management problems and then you can solve Monte Carlo problems like the ones that you, well, hopefully now we've seen in lab three. But, uh, but then hopefully that we can motivate after that, despite the power of these spreadsheets, in the end, if we really want to do interesting things, we probably need more special purpose tools because these start getting very cumbersome once we go beyond something like these simple Monte Carlo sims. But when we get through the we gotta walk before we can run, and so let's walk through these spreadsheets. And so this is kind of the model I'll start with here. Uh, so if you're not familiar with this uh, notation, this is basically saying I've exponentially distributed inter-arrival times coming in to two servers, 
and there is some dispatching policy as to who goes to what server when they're busy. And each server itself has an exponentially distributed service time. So that's, you know, the big focus here is now we have two servers instead of one. And the dispatching policy we'll just use is go to Able, go to the, the top one, unless it's busy, then go to Baker. And so that's what we want to try to simulate using a simple spreadsheet. And so this is example 2.6 from Electric. And so the uh, we start out just like we started before. So we've got callers coming in because we've got one arrival process. So we've got one set of inter-arrival times. So for now, I'm giving you all of those. Uh, but already you now know after the lab that you can draw random numbers from Excel. With a little bit of arithmetic, uh, you can take a uniformly distributed random number from 0 to 1 and turn it into a uniformly distributed number, random number between anything and anything else. Now, with a little bit more arithmetic, you can take that same RAND, uniformly distributed random number between 0 and 1, and turn it into an exponentially distributed random number. So even though Excel may not have a function that allows you to draw from an exponential distribution, we will learn in this class how you turn a, U, a U01, so the, the, the uniformly distributed random number between 0 and 1 that you do know how to, uh, how to draw, into pretty much any distribution you want. So we haven't learned that yet, so I'm just giving you these times, and are, I picked them as integers to be easy. But eventually, you can imagine populating these cells with draws from random. And then every time you resave the spreadsheet, you actually would get different things here. So you would get a, uh, you know, you got a certain set of arrivals that would be like, you know, simulating one day, and if you resave the spreadsheet, it might redraw all these numbers, and it's like suddenly you're simulating another muffin schedule. And so that's where we're going. We haven't figured out how to do that yet. That's why I'm just giving you these lists of numbers. But in reality, we very rarely do get lists of numbers unless you're taking them from real-world data. But we also have this list of numbers, these service times. And likewise, you could have Excel draw these randomly if you knew how to make Excel draw from an exponential distribution. We haven't figured out how to do that yet, but that's just a couple lectures away. All right, so if we have all of these, then, uh, you know, calculating arrival time. Well, that's the same way we did before. We just accumulate all the inter-arrival times, and then we end up getting this arrival time distribution. So it's just whatever the previous one was plus the next one gives us the next arrival time. Then, uh, now we have to be a little clever here in dealing with this dispatching policy. So again, I have to try to think of a relationship that holds across time and space for every line of this spreadsheet. And so what I'm going to do is write a little bit of Excel using an if statement in Excel that basically says, well, if I look at my columns here, I have got a column when Able is available and when Baker is available. So, uh, so basically, when if right now I'm saying these are how many uh, so are in the server right now. So currently nobody's in Able or Baker. So right now both are available. So if I can say here that you know if Able is available, uh, regardless of what Baker is, go to Able. Otherwise, if Able's not available, go to Baker. And that's basically what this will end up being here. Is it'll sort of it just chooses a server based on who is currently busy. And so right now, it arbitrarily chooses Able, but if Able was busy, it would have chosen Baker. And all of this looks like it's populated here because I just kind of have a mask over top of a completed spreadsheet. But if you just implemented this, it wouldn't know what to do here until you populated everything else. And so spreadsheets, again, are kind of confusing in that you sometimes they don't settle out into something that makes sense until you finish them. So if we move on to the next thing, we said, well, We'll need to figure out when the service begins. And so we've got now, it's a little more complicated version of the single server queue. Is it so we know that the service in, if we're lucky, the service begins at the arrival time. So somebody arrives, neither server is busy or there is a free server available. And so uh, it will just be, you know, the service will begin right when they arrive. So we know that has to be part of it. But it's if, uh, Able or Baker are not available. There is a column here that is, you know, when they're available. And so this column here says that they're both available at zero, but later on they might not be available until time five or time six. 
And so we're going to take the max of when they arrived and the min of whichever server is available. So if able is available first, then that will fill in this column. And if that is after this arrival time, then we have to wait for able. So that's where this formula will come from. And so again, this ends up populating out. But it wouldn't, you know, if you're just uh, writing this line bar column by column. So then you say, have to say, well, when does each server complete? Well, we know that able, uh, so if we say able's completion time is going to be uh, if able is the chosen one for this customer. So for customer three, if able is the one that's chosen, then we know that we just take the time that service it begins and we add the service time for customer three. And that's what gives us when able is going to be complete. Otherwise, if it was Baker that was chosen, then we totally ignore this row and we just say, well, the completion time is still the same. So initially, able was chosen up here. And so we know that service began at zero. We add four to it. So able will be available at four. That means the next customer who comes in will not uh, pick able, they'll pick Baker. And so able's next completion time will just carry right on through. And then we do something similar with Baker, where we just, it's the symmetric case. We just flip it so that it just sort of only pays attention when Baker is selected. And so uh, that is actually ends up doing everything for us. Because now that we have, once we have when the service times are complete, then we can figure out all the rest of this stuff. So we now know that, uh, that so if we go back to win server available, the way that formula uh, came in, which right here. So this win server available here, that's just going to take the previous completion time. So if I were to look across here, caller four, able, it says able will be available at seven. Well, that's just in the previous uh, row, that's able's previous completion time. So once we know all the completion times, we know all the availability. Once we know the availability, we know which one will get chosen for each customer. And once we know that, everything else falls out. So this, in principle, gives us a way to use a spreadsheet to go through an MM2, a simulation of an MM2 queue. So you could generate all sorts of arrival, inter-arrival times and all sorts of service times, and this, it would just recalculate. And then we could calculate these performance metrics here, like how long did this caller have to wait? Well, that's going to be whenever their service time began minus their arrival time um, in one second. And then how long did they stay in the system? Well, that gets a little complicated if they chose, if ABLE was chosen, if ABLE's next completion time minus arrival, or if Baker, it's Baker's next completion time minus arrival. And that gives us our total time in system. So these are, these are kind of somehow our state variables are tied up in here, and our performance measures are tied up in here. And so in principle, we can do this giant simulation um, just by setting up these rows and keep filling down, and then we don't have to do any sort of hand simulation. Question? Yeah, so the program basically just indicates that it comes from server and here, right? The two here? Yeah, that just means that there's two servers. So there's a single channel feeding it in, and it then splits off into two servers. And both servers, the M's, we'll go into later, but the M basically means that it's an exponential service time and an exponential inter-arrival time. Is it always going to be just one um, channel serving them? No, the, but this is just kind of uh, the, this, the, so if you take, you'd probably be introduced to this notation, Kindle's notation in 470, when you start talking about networks of queues and things like that. And so these are kind of the, kind of the, the building blocks of much more complicated networks. And so the simplest networks are the ones where you've got sort of one that's feeding in, and then you've got a certain number of servers. But then you'd imagine you could build those up into other things. And so we're just starting with the simple ones, just to show that at least for the simplest ones, the logic exists that you could implement this in a spreadsheet. But kind of the punchline here is although this is possible, this is already getting a little bit crazy to sort of keep track of. All this conditional stuff, like you write, it's a lot of stuff that could go wrong. And this is very, very simple to implement in Arena, much, much simpler than what we do here. So even though we can do it here, and it's totally valid, what we're, as we get to more and more complicated cases, this is just not the way that you want to go if you want to quickly be able to simulate complicated
So I'm not going to ask you to ever simulate an MM2. I'm just trying to hopefully justify to you that it's possible that this could be done, but there are reasons why you wouldn't do it this way because it would just already, it's just, you know, all these conditionals and everything, it just, it's, it's a pain. Imagine if you had three, four, five, or even worse, imagine if your boss said, well, what if you already did this nice simulation of two? What happens if we added three servers? What if we went up to three? Imagine all of these cells, you have to go back and change to change these conditionals so that now they apply to three, you know, Abel, Baker, and Charlie. You know, so, you know, you, it, it would be a, it'd be a mess. So that's, uh, that's kind of why we have these tools like our Are there any other questions about how this is implemented here? Again, I'm not going to, the MM1, I'd like you to sort of feel like you could do that on your own. The MM2, I'm okay with you kind of coming away with it saying, you know what, if I had to figure this out, I could, but I don't necessarily know how to do this on my own. I'm not going to ask you in a homework to do an MM2, but maybe on a midterm, I would ask you to be able to interpret or fill in the gaps on the MM1 simulation. All right, so, um, but let's see a little more interesting examples now. So um, inventory management problems are kind of, again, one of these classical problems in operations research. And they're a little different than these, uh, these queuing problems because we usually assume that the inventory checking period is, is known ahead of time. It's deterministic. So the idea is every day, every hour, every minute, you check your inventory, and then you take some action. Now, the randomness comes into play is that you may not know uh, what the demand is. How much demand do we need to meet with this inventory? You also may not know how long it's going to take when you make another order. So you order something, and it might take, uh, um, you know, a, it might take a day for that shipment to arrive one week, but the next week you do an order, and it maybe takes a whole six days for that shipment to arrive. How do we deal with that randomness? So that's where we kind of the randomness is introduced as opposed to the timing of demand orders. We kind of know every day there's going to be some demand. It's the quantity that we don't know ahead of time. So this is much like that muffin baking simulation in lab two where we know that every, whatever I said, every minute uh, or every, whatever the time unit was, we get a random number of muffins that arrive that may or may not go in to the oven. So you can almost think that the empty oven space is your inventory. So you've got to think, how big of an oven do we need? That's kind of like the inventory management problem here. And the arriving muffins are the demand. So if you have a giant oven, but you only ever get very tiny muffin orders, then in order to fill your whole oven, you might have to wait a huge amount of time to accumulate enough demand before you actually serve that demand. Or you can service it immediately, but then you're going to have a bunch of in empty inventory, uh, or a bunch of inventory that you, you basically bought an oven that you don't use. So that's how this muffin making simulation is sort of meant to model an inventory management problem. But the realistic inventory management, or not too realistic, but the more classic inventory management problems that you may have heard about in some of your other classes are like the news vendor problem. So if you're an industrial engineer, you should be familiar with the news vendor problem or the single period or perishable model for inventory management. The idea here is imagine a news vendor, they're selling a newspaper. So every day they go out, they got a bunch of newspapers. And there's fixed prices for those newspapers. We don't know how many people are going to want a newspaper each day. But we do know that at the end of the day, the newspapers have no value. So they're a perishable product. And this is not meant to be only for analyzing you know, newspaper sales. There's a bunch of other products that approximate this. You can imagine produce would be a similar thing. How many heads of lettuce do we want to stock at the grocery store, given that after a certain period, we're pretty sure that those, that, those the heads of lettuce are going to be perishable and have zero value. So they, they may have some value. Maybe you can compost them or whatever. But if we approximate them with this model, it allows us to make decisions about how many heads of lettuce do we order. So that's what we're kind of making. Now, the 470 way to do this would be to assume some distribution of demand. So let's say every day you get something a normally distributed or whatever, a gamma distributed demand function. So every day you draw a random number from a distribution that you know ahead of time. You might know the mean. And, uh, and given that you know that distribution, you create an optimization objective like this one, like the average 
sale price times uh, the minimum of your inventory or your demand. So it's, you know, either you sold your entire inventory or you only sold whatever demand was that day, uh, minus how much it took for you to actually buy each newspaper to stock up um, times whatever inventory was kind of left over. So well, you know, well, the, or you have, this is sort of the cost you had going into the day, and this is the benefit you had coming out of the day. And so the idea is you want to maximize your profit. So this, again, is the standard. With using those tools from stochastic operations research, you could do some relatively simple math, and you could come up with a demand which maximizes, or sorry, an inventory which maximizes profit. But the problem with this is that what if we wanted another performance measure? Maybe we didn't care about profit. Maybe we cared about a performance measure that's more complicated than profit. Or what if we wanted to violate some of these key assumptions here? Like, let's say it's not a perishable product. Let's say it has some value. So now at the end of the day, I have a quantity, it's another random quantity, because I don't know how many are going to be left over, but they are going to have some value that I can recoup. So that becomes very complicated and perhaps even intractable to solve mathematically, and that's why we might turn to simulation instead. So in the book's case, they say, well, let's make it a little more uh, complicated. We're going to have a quantity Q of newspapers purchased for resale each day. So this is how many newspapers you put in your satchel or whatever to sell. And then we've got a demand. And so, of course, if the demand is greater than Q, then we made, uh, we're, we're making too few papers, so we're missing opportunity. If the demand's less than Q, uh, then we're making too many papers, and that's wasted production. And then, so we can then ask the kind of the same problem, the 470 problem here, and we can say, well, how does the quantity Q, how many we buy, affect our profit over 20 days? So already things are getting a little interesting because we can now say over 20 days. It's not something in the limits, or it's not, you know, just, just, it's, we can actually have a time horizon. The other thing is we can actually solve for a distribution and not just an average. So rather than saying what is our average profit, we can actually have a distribution of profit. We can see that there are some universes where we make $200 in profit after 20 days, and there are other universes where we only make $80 in profit after 20 days. Why is this distribution interesting? Well, now, if, let's say your boss, uh, or such as you in general, are trying to figure out whether you want to continue to be a news vendor, you might say it's a success if I can make uh, $100 after every 20 days. Well, with this distribution, I can now calculate things like, what is my downside risk? What is the probability that I won't make $100 every 20 days? And here, $100, it looks like most of the time I'm above $100. If I just ask about the mean, because I don't know about the variance, it's hard for me to know what my downside risk is. But now that I have the distribution, I can ask these risk questions. How likely is it? for you know, how much of, of the tail of the distribution meets my criteria or not. So the distribution can be much more interesting and useful, but solving for distributions mathematically can be a lot more difficult, uh, whereas in simulation we kind of get them for free, as I hope you're starting to see as you're doing things like lab two and lab three. All right, so um, the other sort of big inventory, are there any questions about the news vendor problem? And turning into a simulation. So of course we don't know exactly how to do this yet, and if you go to the book problem, they actually do the news vendor problem in a spreadsheet. So it is possible to do, to get this output from a spreadsheet. So this is one of the classes of problems that's still relatively simple. Uh, if you want to get a little more complicated, again, this is even easier to build in Arena, as you'll see uh, later. All right, so another sort of classic inventory management problem that we can do in SIM, and we find and frequently uh, investigate in SIM, are these order up to problems. So an order up to, in in problem here, is this thing where every, I've got, uh, you know, I review my inventory at certain periods here. So that's this N, it's the length of time until my next inventory review. And then at the review, I order some quantity that brings me back up to a particular level. So there's two decision variables that we worry about when we do the operations research here. How frequently do I check my inventory, and what level do I then bring things back up to? 
And so the, the force that's fighting against this is, of course, the demand, which is random, and the lead time. So someone's going to come, and they're wanting to buy a lot of my inventory. So that's you know this reduction in inventory. But then when I order up to the lead time, so how long it takes for my inventory to then come back up, may also be there may be some delay there. So even though uh, you know I, I might think that well you know based on my demand distribution as long as I can order up to here on this day if it actually takes a long time for that order to arrive back in, for me to restock my inventory I might actually want to check my inventory earlier and order up to earlier so that I account for this delay in the demand so this becomes a more complicated it seems simple you know I just need to, you know two variables how often do I check and what's my regulated inventory level, but it's complicated to figure out how do we come up with these numbers. And so we can do that in SIM. And so in the book version, they set up a little spreadsheet where every n days they order enough refrigerators to bring the inventory up to n units. Orders take several days to arrive, and that several days is a random variable. So it's, uh, and here, I don't know if they actually draw from a random variable or if they just give you a list of numbers, but where we're going, we would just draw that from a random distribution. And then each day, there is a random demand, which, which reduces that inventory. And so then we can then uh, ask performance questions. So we can say, how does the MA ordering policy affect, say, <clears throat> the, how many back orders we have? How often we go into the negative or lost sales? And, uh, and then this spreadsheet can give us kind of a solution to that. So this is another type of problem that we can actually answer in a spreadsheet or that we can answer eventually in a readout. So there will be a lab where you'll effectively build an order up to system in arena. And we see that it's a relatively simple pipeline where we can ask a lot more complicated things. So again, these are standard inventory problems you should know as an IE at this stage in your career. Any questions about those? Okay. So right, now uh, you know, channeling off here so that getting into lab three, you're starting to work with Monte Carlo simulations. The first part of lab three, you just estimate pi um, using a kind of a standard method. Um, I go into, in the lab video, I go into the definitions of like where this term comes from. It was actually a code word used to describe this technique, which they use to analyze the physics behind nuclear weapons, but they couldn't discuss it you know, using this, this technique out in the open, and so they came up with this code word, Monte Carlo, which has to do with the casino in Monaco, the Monte Carlo Casino, and that was their way of inferring you know, this new randomness technique. And coming out of this came all sorts of new random number generators, all sorts of things that are used on all sorts of modern computers today, but it's kind of interesting that it all came out of these physicists and mathematicians trying to get wrap their heads around nuclear weapons. And now we're using them to estimate pi and come up with better inventory distributions and so on. So uh, the types of problems you can solve with these, uh, the, the, one, the first problem in the book they go into is these reliability problems. And I think this is a really interesting problem. So you've got a machine with three ball bearings. And this, again, could be modeled. We have the same sort of problem where a building has got a hundred fluorescent lights, and you want to decide when to replace those fluorescent lights. Every time you replace a ball bearing, you have to pay for that ball bearing, but you also have to take the machine down, and you have to pay for the person who actually does the replacement. So there's all these different ways that you can pay this cost. But if you don't replace it, there's cost to that as well. You know, So like in a light bulb, you, you, the, the building can keep running until there's a certain amount of redundancy. But eventually, once the, the room is totally dark, it's inoperable. But a machine like this, of course, if a ball bearing fails, then the machine goes down. And so only we can't tolerate any more than one failure. One failure is all we can tolerate. So we have to actually replace them a little early. And so the question is, when do we replace them? And do we replace all of them? So imagine three different policies. Uh, you know, whatever one ball bearing fails, wait for it to fail, and then replace only that one. Or when one of them fails, you can replace all of them because you sort of anticipate the others are going to fail sometime soon. Or you could just replace all three of them on a regular schedule, even if they didn't fail. Now, these two seem like you're wasting life in those ball bearings. 
But if you consider that there's the downtime that you accumulate while you're doing the repairs and the labor is just as costly, then it may actually be better to then waste a little bit of the ball bearing because you end up benefiting in less downtime and less labor. And so that's kind of the complicated question that we would like to solve with this experiment. And so our hypothesis here is that accumulated downtime and labor costs are greater than gains from operating ball bearings for the full lifetime. And so if we run a simulation, then we should be able to see that if all bar bell bearings are replaced at the same time, then the total accumulated cost will be less than the case where each ball bearing is replaced as it fails. That's what we're trying to test. We don't know if this is the case, but that's why we run the simulation. So we run a bunch of replications under one condition, a bunch of replications under the other condition, and compare the average costs using a statistically valid method like a t-test, and then that tells us which policy is best. And so you can imagine implementing this, every row being having a lifetime, a failure time for each ball bearing, and then each sample is a lifetime and a delay accumulated from 15 rows. And so the simulation runs for 15 rows. So you, you get each row are three ball bearings, and then you can imagine that those three ball bearings, just like the numbers that you're using in your critical paths for lab three, so you might say that, well, when one fails, we have to replace all of them. That's just like your critical path, where one path determines everything. Or uh, you might say we wait for all the others to fail. So that kind of depends, that changes the way in which each row relates to each other row. And then we can end up deciding, you know, what are the costs that accumulate from these different policies where this is our kind of experiment. So we're simulating three ball bearing lifetimes, which are our three random variables. And in each row, we're deciding whether we kind of keep the old lifetime or we draw new lifetimes. And then we end up, every time we draw a new lifetime, we have to pay for a new ball bearing. So it's a way in which we can simulate the operation of a machine just by drawing random numbers in a spreadsheet. So if we do that, then we end up getting an answer to sort of these average costs, and we can compare those. Other sort of standard Monte Carlo things are I drop a bunch of, I have a function that is a, a, a function of a bunch of random variables. I don't know what the distribution of that function will be after I add all those, those variables together. Let's say every, every bomber carries 10 bombs. Each bomb uh, has a certain distribution of locations it can fall on. And I want to ask, what is the probability or what is the distribution of the total area affected by these 10 bombs? Question. Can you summarize what the differences between the three different types are? The three different types? So, um, Oh, uh, well, so I mean, they're just different types of problems. So these are queuing problems. And so this is a problem where you've got, these are problems where your arrivals, the, the time between arrivals is unknown, but the number of arrivals is known. And the time in which you need to service each one of those arrivals is known. So this is like your standard uh, store clerk problem. An inventory management problem is you know that every fixed time period you have to take an inventory but you don't know how much inventory you're going to need. And then these Monte Carlo simulations, that's kind of a method in which we are trying to estimate some static quantity, and we do that by running a bunch of random experiments and then taking an aggregate of those random experiments as opposed to finding some deterministic way to solve a problem. So instead of taking an integral underneath the curve using the Riemann method, there's a way to use a Monte Carlo method to actually sample from a distribution to get that integral. Instead of calculating pi by actually measuring the circumference of a circle and the diameter circle and trying to uh, divide the two, you can, you can estimate pi just by throwing darts at a dartboard. So I wouldn't uh, pit Monte Carlo against these, but I would say these are two types of classic operations research problems, and this is a method you could use that we would contrast with the methods we're about to use in the rest of the class, which are more dynamic. These are more static. All right, so you know, all these Monte Carlo methods are going to look just like your lab three. You're going to have a bunch of rows. And in each row, you're going to draw a bunch of random variables. And somewhere down that row, you're going to aggregate those random variables. And then at the end, you're going to aggregate across aggregations. 
And so that's what you did in lab three. But usually a Monte Carlo distribution is, you're trying to either estimate an average, you're trying to estimate a distribution, but the key feature of a Monte Carlo simulation is that you're using an ensemble of simple interactions between random variables to try to estimate something else. So I have, a, you know, each row has got 10 random variables, and I use that to calculate something, and that thing that I calculate becomes a random variable, so then I generate a thousand rows. So now I have a thousand random variables that were calculated from 10 random variables per row. And that calculation tells me something useful. In the lab, it might be an estimate of pi, or it might be an estimate of the duration of one of these stochastic activity networks. So that's, you know, gets to this, you know, I wanted to give this sort of uh, preview of lab three to kind of explain these things. So this lab three comes from section 2.5, uh, section 2.54 actually, of your lecture textbook. And the idea here is you have a total, you have this full activity that has three subparts which are taken on in parallel. You've got one part that you know will never take less than six minutes and will never take more than 12 minutes. And we model it as taking sort of being any time in between with equal density you know, across them. So it could be, it's just as likely to between, be between six and seven minutes as it is between seven and eight minutes. But it will never take less than six, and it will never take more than 12. And the average here is nine minutes. In parallel with that, there are another activity that has two sub-activities, one that never takes less than three, never takes more than six, so its average is four and a half followed by another one whose average is four and a half. Again, never takes less than three, more than six. So the average down this path is also nine. Then you've got this top one where each small sub thing, so these are sequences, you have to do this before you can do this. Never will take more than four, never will take more than four, never will take more than four. Um, the average here is going to be three, three, and three. So the average on this top path is gonna be nine. So you look at this, and if you were just to ask, so how long until I finish my activity on average? And you might think it's nine. You might say, you know what? It's three activities that each take nine minutes on average to complete. So I'm doing them in parallel. They're not affecting each other. So why wouldn't the whole activity take an average of nine? Does anybody have a thought about that? So take uh, 30 seconds or so and talk to your neighbor. And give me your guess as to why the average for the whole activity network might be more than nine. And just try to think it through. It's a puzzle. All right, let's bring it back in. So from the left side of my, I guess, stage, stage left side of the room. So uh, does anybody have sort of a thought as to why would we expect the total activity network to have an average greater than nine, even though each sub-activity has an average of nine? Anybody over here? Before I cold. 
Sure, give me your answer. That's right. That, yeah, at every every individual activity, it's a random number between two and four, two and four, two and four. We know on average it's three, three, and three. So this top one on average always on average is nine. This middle one on average adds up to nine, and this bottom one on average adds up to nine. And yet, when we have to wait for all three of them together to complete before we can say the whole activity is complete, I'm saying the average of the total activity is going to be greater than 9. Yeah? Uh, Chris, if you have to wait on the first step, and it takes the maximum of time, then the rest of them take the average, it's still going to be 9. OK. Um, so I think that's getting there. So you're saying that on the first step, so we'll call, you know, you're saying if you have to wait, you're saying that, that even though I might have gotten lucky enough for these to be 9, this one down here, I might have still had to hang around and wait because there's just some chance it's going to be greater than nine, right? And that's basically what we're getting at here. Is that imagine how you could, like, in order for you to be nine, that means that some of your realizations have to be less than nine, and some have to be greater than nine. But the total duration is a maximum. That's the function. We're taking the max of these three branches. Yeah. Question. So you're Well, I'd say the average is, I would say that if we're only focused on averages, the average is representative of the top branch, the middle branch, and the bottom branch. But what's interesting is that when you take a maximum of three random variables, the average will not be the average of the averages. It's not going to be the maximum of the averages. So that's a, well, I think when a lot of people look at these parallel problems, they think that the expectation of the maximum is equal to the maximum of the expectations. But that's not the case. And the reason that's not the case is that maximum is a funny nonlinear thing where if you think about it, uh, if you, in order for this to be under the average, then this, this top branch has to be under the average and this one has to be under the average, and this one has to be under the average. And so now we've got, it's very unlikely, if I happen to be lucky enough to get a fast time out of this one, I probably am not going to be lucky to also get a fast time out of these other two. And so there is this regularizing component. It's kind of like, you know, like uh, let's say you're, you're getting up in the morning and you've got a house full of friends and you all carpool together. And you're excited that you got ready for everybody else, and you're ready to go. But you still end up getting to class late, because regardless of how fast you were, the speed they take has nothing to do with the speed you take. And so if we're always focused on, you know, it's really hard to get to class early, because everyone has to be early. Everyone has to get through their routine quickly. And in this case, it's difficult for us to have a lower than average total activity because that means that every branch would have to be lower than average. And that's just not going to happen very often. But if one of these is above average, it doesn't even matter what the other two are. And so that's why we're going to see a shift away from the average so that it'll be greater than average. And so that's why don't expect your duration. When you take your expectations in lab three, if you got nine as your expectation, you might have done something wrong. A common error in lab three is for people to draw one random variable for here and multiply it by three, or one random variable here and multiply it by two. You need to draw three separate random variables and add them together, and two totally different random variables and add them together, and one here. You know, that, so that's one common mistake. If you made that mistake, then some of these things, like the average time being greater than nine might not hold up. There's other weird things here, like this here is the distribution of outcomes from the lower path. It is not lower than six, it is not greater than 12, but 
it is flat in between. Now the top path here is the sum of three uniforms, each one of them not less than two, not greater than four, but flat between two and four. And yet, when I sum them up together, I got this thing that looks like a bell curve. The bell curve is not less than six. The bell curve is not more than 12, but it is not flat across here. And that is for the same reason that we just talked about. It's because in order for this to be, basically the idea here is that um, in order for you to get a 12, then that means that I need to draw a four, a four, and a four. And it's, it's fine, you can draw a four from uniform distribution between zero and or between two and four, but to draw three of them independently is very unlikely. So although one uniform distribution can give you that maximum value. The sum of three of them is probably not going to give you that maximum value very often. So as you start adding things up together, you necessarily take distributions and you squish them down. Does anybody remember the central limit theorem? What is the central limit theorem? Yeah. That's a good summary. Regardless of what distribution you have, as long as you add enough independent draws together, then the distribution of the sum will look approximately normal. And this is the reason why. You're actually experiencing this in the lab. You're adding up three of these uniforms and getting something that looks like a bell curve. And basically what you're doing is you're saying, regardless of what the shape was initially, it's very unlikely for me to be on the edges of that shape in everything I'm adding up together. And that's why my mass on the edges shrinks. And that's why I end up getting a bell curve. And so we'll talk more about that next week or the week after that. But that's what you're kind of starting to see here. If we were to plot the histogram through here, it would actually look like a triangle. And so if you add two together, it looks like a triangle. You add three, it starts looking like a hump. If you add 10 of these together, it would look just like a normal distribution. It just happens to be truncated um, at 6 and 12. All right, so that's kind of what you're going to start playing with. And so in lab three, in every spreadsheet row, I just want to emphasize you draw six independent random variables. So uh, you, if you want to use rand between, that's fine. Otherwise, use rand and then scale it the way it talks about in the lab by multiplying and adding. But they have to be six independent ones. Don't draw one random variable and multiply it by three. You have to add them up together to get this sort of central limit effect. And then the total time is the required max path. And then the distribution is the distribution of those total times, the distribution of those maxes. And, uh, and a lot of these things, I've asked how many runs are enough to make, these distribution, uh, to make these estimates. And it really depends on the variability. So in an experiment like this one, if there wasn't much variability in your output, you would only need three or four replications. If there's a lot of variability, in order to really capture that variability, you might need 500, you might need 5,000, you might need 50,000. That's the reason why we need 10,000 lines for your estimate of pi, but only 500 lines uh, from this, because there's a lot less variability here than there is in the pi estimate. And by the way, rather than dragging down 10,000 lines, if you just scroll down and highlight the 10,000 row, you can go to edit and fill down, and it'll do that. So that's a little, at least on the carpal tunnel, it's a little easier than dragging that tiny little square down 10,000 lines. And there's lots of other ways you could do that too. But just as a tip, um, you know, edit, fill down, it's easier than dragging. All right, any questions about the lab experience? All right, so the only other thing I have for you today is just kind of a message. And that is, we, we can do a lot with spreadsheets. That's all I've tried to motivate you. But if we really want to go into the systems that are interesting to us, the systems that get you a job, those are not going to be the relatively simple systems that we've captured with the spreadsheet. They're going to be far more complicated systems. Systems where somebody will ask you, like in a fast food place, do I use one cube with multiple order spots? Or do I use two cubes, each one of them with an order spot? Oh, and by the way, do I also have people mobile ordering? And how does that fit into that? So at that point, you know, I've got orders coming in from different places. 
And you're going to be asked to compare not just policies for how to handle these orders, but even whole structures of do I bother with implementing a mobile order system on an app? Do I bother with building a second line? Which line do I build? A line that looks like this or a line that looks like this? These are problems that are very easy to investigate in ARENA, but would be a real headache to try to investigate in a spreadsheet. So that's kind of where we're going. So why uh, do we use these simulation tools? They automate tedious coding that uh, can lead into errors. They often include high-level components that reduce the work for you. So in ARENA, there's actually carts, conveyor belts, client link queues that are already done for you. You don't have to build them yourself. And they usually include these graphical options that are a lot nicer to look at than these spreadsheets. And so, uh, so that's what we'll start into. In lab four, you're going to see that with uh, an agent-based modeling tool called NetLogo. Some of you write your name lab four, uh, but uh, if you haven't done that yet or if you're, you know, if you're planning on doing it, that'll be your only introduction to NetLogo in this class, and then we'll do all ARENA after that. Uh, so that's kind of where we're starting. It'll be agent-based modeling uh, in lab four, system di uh, and then process uh, discrete event systems for the rest of the semester. And if you're interested in system dynamics modeling, that's all a, a whole class on that in 477. All right, any questions? So uh, I'm actually going to give you lecture. So lecture C2 is normally what we do on Tuesday. Um, I'm actually going to skip and do lecture D1, although the ICA that was due is still going to be due on the normal D1 time. And then lecture C2 is just a tutorial that I put all online on NetLogo. Uh, I, have to, I have to be away on Thursday. So next Thursday's class will be canceled, and we'll do the D1 lecture on Tuesday. And if you want to do the NetLogo tutorial, you can do that online. Um, otherwise, let's see the attendance response here. And so uh, the question here is um, the central limit theorem um, states that if you add up a bunch of independent variables together, independent random variables together, what is the approximate distribution of outcomes you get? What distribution is the limiting distribution when you add up a bunch of independent random variables? 